we could look at this story and be like, way to go, guys. Like, good for y'all. What a moment for y'all to see, or you, sorry, if you're not in the southeastern United States. What a moment for you that you get to go do this and you get to have this moment in history and like, hey, good for you. Or, or we realize we could find ourselves in the same place for you and I. Welcome to Champion Church Online. Wherever you're watching from, we are so glad that you're here. If we can serve you in any way, please leave a comment. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so we can help you champion every season of your life. We've been looking at the road to the cross leading up to Resurrection Sunday morning, but not just in a way of the historical facts of what happened. That stuff is good and we should know that, but instead, how does it apply to you and I all of this time Later, Because honestly, if it's just historical facts, we miss out on the words of life that they are to you and I. We're going to go to Mark chapter 11 today. So we're going to the Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Let's jump in. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into that village over there, Jesus told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you what you're doing, just say the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their garments over it and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others spread leafy branches or palms that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, praise God, blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, praise God in the highest heaven. I really want us to picture this for a moment, this Palm Sunday, this triumphant entry, and not just see it in the text, but put it there maybe in your mind's eye as if you are standing with them, where Jesus gives two of the disciples such an instruction, clear instruction to obey. Think about it. At this point, people are flooding into Jerusalem for Passover. The energy in the city is palpable. Like they, is, they know who Jesus is and the disciples know, hey, this thing is really seems to be coming to a head right now. And Jesus brings two of them in and he says, hey, listen, I want you to go into that village. And when you go into the village, you're going to find a donkey that no one has ever rid on, rode on, rid on, <laughs> that no one has ever rode on, right? And I want you to go there, and when you get there, untie it. And if anybody asks what you're doing, tell them that the Lord needs it, because at this point, people knew who Jesus was, and they'll let it happen. Could you imagine the heartbeat of these disciples? Their heart rate has to go up. And as they maybe look at one another, and they begin to walk t towards this village, and then boom, they see this donkey standing outside. Side, tied up just as Jesus had told him. The, the excitement has to get there. Of, oh my goodness, like I know he's the Messiah, but look exactly what he told us to do, exactly how he sent us. It is happening. And they go and they begin to untie it. And just like Jesus said, the people yell out, hey, what are you doing with that donkey? And he's like, hey, listen, the Lord needs it. And they permit it. The excitement has to be there that God has guided them. He has sent them. And now Jesus is about to make the triumphant entry into the city. And here's the thing. We could look at this story and be like, way to go, guys. Like, good for y'all. What a moment for y'all to see, or you, sorry, if you're not in the southeastern United States. What a moment for you that you get to go do this and you get to have this moment in history and like, hey, good for you. Or, or we realize we could find ourselves in the same place for you and I. And if you're taking notes today, the first thing I want you to know is Jesus still gives 
direction. And the same way he did for them, look at it again in verse two. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say the Lord needs it and will return it soon. And I love that it doesn't just stop there for the disciples. But even now, in our day, wherever you are and whenever you're watching this or listening to this or however you're consuming this, we still can be led and directed by the creator of everything. Like it's hard to wrap our mind around that Jesus still wants to lead us and guide us, that he gave us his spirit to do this very thing. That again, it's not just for us to look at the disciples and be like, way to go for y'all. No, it's something for us even now that we in our everyday life, whether you feel like you have purpose or you feel like no one even knows you or sees you, you and I can still be led by God. And this isn't something I'm just making it up. This is right here in the scripture. I'm going to give you like 14 different ones. But watch this. If you're like, well, I don't feel like I'm being led by God. It starts with the posture of your heart. These disciples, the posture of their heart in this moment, these disciples are willing to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. And for us, we need to have the same thing. We need to have this posture of our heart that, Lord, if you say it, the answer is yes. If you send me, the answer is yes. If you direct me, absolutely, that's what I'm doing. It is a posture of heart that you and I need. And maybe, maybe, this might be the only thing you need to hear. Lord, Help me posture my heart in a way to hear your leading and to feel your guidance. That's what you see in Jeremiah 42. Jeremiah 42, these different people all come to Jeremiah and they're in a tough spot and they're like, listen, we want God to guide us. And it's a prayer that you and I can pray. Pray, look at it here. Pray that the Lord your God will show us what to do and where to go. I love this. Show us what to do and where to go. They are giving the willingness for an instruction, like, Lord, give us an instruction to obey. I've said it before. I want to say it again right here. If you are looking for an absolute guarantee to answer prayer, it is this, asking, tell me what to do. Give me an instruction to obey. Show me exactly what you want me to do. Every time, I promise you, I'm telling you, God will. He'll put something on your heart. I want you to do this. Now, let me say this. He's not going to lay it out perfectly how it's going to go because there's a faith involved in the walk, but he will always give you the next instruction to obey. I hope you caught that. God's not going to tell you it starts here and then it goes to this and it happens this. You know why? Because we'll try to jump in and mess it all up. But what God does do is he says, listen, I'm going to give you a simple instruction to obey. And if you will do that, if you'll trust me in the step, I'll take care of everything else. That's how God is. That's what he tells us. And I love that. Jeremiah 42, show us what to do and and where to go. Isaiah 6, essentially the same thing. Watch it here. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. The posture of your heart is so important when we are being led by God. It is so important to have the right posture. Here I I am, Lord, send me. Because we know this, it's so easy. It's so easy to get caught up in our own thing, to get caught up in our own schedules, to get caught up in all of these different things. And it's like, Lord, it'd be great if you could just give me something while I'm doing this. If you could just give me something on that road, that would be wonderful. But the posture of our heart has to be, Lord, whatever road you say, the answer is yes. However you lead me, the answer is yes. Because again, Jesus gives direction and he gives guidance. It's not just for a few. It's not just for the select cute ones that maybe might be popular or maybe more holy than you and you feel like they're better connected to God than you and I are. But here's the truth of the matter is if you have the right posture of heart, Holy Spirit will speak to you, yes you, and give you an instruction to obey. You just have to posture your heart and pray that prayer, Lord, guide me of what I should do and where I should go. It's not these, just these two verses. Look at John 16, 13. Jesus says this, when the spirit, meaning his spirit, the Holy Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. Do you see that? He will 
guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own, but will tell you what he has heard. Heard from who? Heard from the Father and heard from the Son. Now watch this. He will tell you about the future. Well, how would you guide unless you knew what was coming? And he literally, Jesus literally says, listen, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth and he'll tell you about what's to come. What did Jesus do with the disciples on that Palm Sunday? He said, I want you to go to this town. Here's where the donkey's going to be. Here's probably what's going to be said. Here's how you answer it. You just need to step. And it's the same for us. He, I, I mean, my goodness, I feel like, no pun intended, I am beating this horse right here that I hope you get it. He gives us instructions to obey. He desires to lead us. He desires to guide us. We just have to have the a willing posture in our heart where it's not all about us, but instead, instead, it's about our heart saying, Lord, wherever you say to go, I'm going. Let's look at another Galatians 5, 25. If the spirit is the source of our life, we must also allow the spirit to direct every aspect of our lives. Isaiah 30, 21. Your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Isaiah 42, 16. I will walk the blind by an unknown way and guide them on paths they've never traveled. This is the Lord speaking. I will smooth their difficult road and make their dark mysteries bright with light. These are the things I will do for them, for I will never abandon my beloved ones. Psalm 32, 8. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. In Romans 8, 14, kind of to wrap this up. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. God. So what I'm trying to say is he wants to lead you. <laughs> he wants to guide you. And when he, when we allow, when we, we say, Lord, it's not what I want. It's what you want. Not my will, your will. We know that's what Jesus would pray on that Thursday in Gethsemane. Not my will, but your will. What Jesus does then is he will send you. He guides and he sends What's the difference there? When he's, if he's sending us anywhere, he has graced us to go. Now that's very like Christianese. So let me break that down a little bit better. If God is sending you somewhere, he gives you the strength and the resources that you need to go. And that's what he does with the disciple. He brings two of them and he says, I'm sending y'all to this city. He gives the strength and the resources of what they needed in that moment for them to step out and go. And here's the thing. I've said this before. I want to say it again. If God commands it, he graces it. If God commands it, he gives you the strength to do it. He is never going to give you something. He's never going to tell you something that you cannot do. In your weakness, that is where you find his strength. And you might say, I can't do that. That's okay because his strength now is in us and works through us where we could do the very thing that God has called you and I to do. So he'll guide you and then he will send you. And here's, here's the thing I was thinking about. When it says he brought two of them, we really aren't told who the two are. Most people believe it was Peter and John, right? But we really aren't told. But it's interesting to me, a few things here, that Jesus always puts the two together. He never sends somebody isolated. Why? Because you were never meant to do life alone. You were never meant to do life alone. Now, I don't know where you're watching this from. We have people that watch legitimately from all over and you might feel alone where you are. And I'm not minimizing that at all, but I do want to say, hey, I hope here that even through this, you find some online community. We just released this week as well, brand new podcast from uh, my mom is on it. Uh, my wife is on it. My sisters are on it. And if you, if you are a female and you are looking for women like community, I encourage you go to our page, go to the playlist. It's called Breakfast at Mom's check it out there and because we're trying to create as much community as we can through this like thank God we live in a time where we can do it through this but I want to tell you I would begin to ask the Lord God guide me for good people around me wherever I am and then watch what he'll do he'll send you with those right people we couldn't do all of this today right here just in this way without having people to do it with us and that we could lock arms with in community. Now, I can't think of the two being sent without thinking about Luke chapter 10, where Jesus sends out 72 disciples. He sends out, he sends them out and to do the work of 
the kingdom. He literally sends them out to announce the kingdom. Look at it here. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. That is, I could preach that, but I don't have time. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Then after this, Jesus gives them clear instructions of what to do. Why? Because he'll always guide and he will always send. There is always an instruction for you and I to obey and he gives you his strength and his joy and his love where you can now actually carry it out. Where you say, there's no way I could do that through him. I mean, what's the, what's the cliche verse? Uh, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. Why? Because he strengthens me and where you can carry it out. Now, when the disciples come back to him, this is interesting. When the disciples come back to him, Jesus sends them out. They go and they minister, right? They announce the kingdom. They bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus to people, right? Watch what Jesus and what Jesus says and watch what happens next. When the 70 disciples returned to Jesus, they were ecstatic with joy telling him, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. Jesus replied, while you were ministering, I watched Satan topple until he fell suddenly from heaven like lightning to the ground. Now you understand that I've imparted to you my authority to trample over his kingdom. You will trample upon every demon before you and overcome every power Satan possesses. Absolutely nothing will harm you as you walk in this authority. However, your real source of joy isn't merely that spirits submit to your authority, but that your names are written in the journals of heaven and that you belong to God's kingdom. This is the true source of your authority. So what does that mean to you and I? When we are being led and we are being sent, we can make a difference in the darkness we see in the world today. Because sometimes it's so easy to feel like darkness is so much more powerful than light. And there could not be, the, the opposite could not be more true. Light always puts darkness on the run. And Jesus say, says, hey, listen, when I saw you ministering, this is what I saw happen. Many people believe Jesus is talking about when Satan uh, fell from heaven, when he was Lucifer, when he was essentially the worship leader of heaven. That's what a lot of people think Jesus is talking about. I think it's both. I think Jesus is saying, yeah, listen, I've seen him fall like lightning, but I also saw principalities and powers in the air fall because when he says heaven here, he's not talking about the paradise of heaven. He's talking about the spirit realm of the heavenlies, if you will. And I know I'm giving you a lot here, but track with me. And what he's saying is, listen, when we go out and we are being led and God has sent us with clear instructions, something happens in the spirit realm that could not happen any other way. And we can put darkness on the run and more people can taste and see that the Lord is good because that's what we're still on the earth for. That's why we are saved, not by works, but for works where we can display God's kingdom in the earth today. And these guys, bring it back to Palm Sunday. They got an instruction, go get a donkey. Go get the donkey. What's, what's happening here? They're actually fulfilling Zechariah, uh, what is it, 9-9. Nine, nine. We're going to come to that in a second. Their instruction was go get a donkey because that's what they needed right then. And here's the thing. God will guide us and he will give us and he will send us with instructions right now for our day and time as well. And if you're like, well, I don't know where to start. Well, Mark 16 Look at it here, gives us these instructions. And Jesus told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages. They, or some translations would say new tongues. And they will be able to handle snakes with safety and they drink. And if they drink anything poisonous, it will not hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. So if you're like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what instruction to start with. Start with that right there. Go into the world and announce the kingdom. Show people God's heart and watch light put darkness on the run. So we've seen how God gives direction. 
He sends us. Jesus sends us. And here's the next thing. I want us to flip our perspective now. I want us to flip our perspective to the donkey. And here's what I'm thinking. Zechariah 9. Here's what I want us to see. Because this could have been a horse. Right? This could have been a horse. And and many people believe with the triumphant entry that Jesus would have rode a horse, but that's not God's plan. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. Now, you could pull a few different practical things. Number one, you can say that God always keeps his promises. Zechariah prophesied uh, about this, and then it was fulfilled in that moment. And it's a good thing to remember that God always fulfills his promises. Even when it seems like it's taken forever or taken longer than you thought or longer than you expected, God is a promise keeper, and he will fulfill what he said. And maybe that's just all you need to hear today, that if God said it, he will fulfill it. Do not lose hope today. And that's what they would have seen there. That prophecy was being fulfilled yet again. But again, I want us to see it from the point of the donkey, that the Messiah came riding in on a triumphant entry on a donkey. Something that most people would think would be inadequate to bring in a king. What's the point? If you don't feel like you are worth much, even a donkey brought the king of kings into the city. And you might not feel at all like your life matters, like you have purpose. You just kind of go through the motions and go through the mundane and you, you can't put darkness on the run. You haven't been led. You don't feel like God has sent you. If he used a donkey, he can use you and me. And that's what I love about it. What other people might have overlooked, God had chosen for that moment. And many people might overlook you and you feel like it doesn't matter, but God has you here. As cliche as it might sound, hear me though, God has you here for such a time as this. And I think about it. The donkey, he was born at just the right time to be at just that right spot and everything led for that moment. And he might have just thought he was going through the motions and maybe you feel the same way, That, but God has been ordaining things and everything is kind of lined up and it's time for you to carry Jesus to people. It's time for you to quit waiting for other people to do it. It's time for you to stop saying, well, I'm just that's just not me. No, maybe you, in a way no one else can, can carry Jesus. Jesus to people. Speaking to people, I I think it's, I I can't read this story and overlook the point that they had to untie the donkey, that someone else had to untie it. Don't put, let me say it like this, don't push people away because that might be the person that's supposed to untie and let you free where you can truly carry Jesus. That's why community is so important because other people can untie you and set you up for where you're supposed to go. I think the story of Lazarus, when he was dead and Jesus calls him out of the grave, Jesus tells the people around him, untie him because God uses people around us to bring freedom from within us. Does that make sense? God will use the people around us to where you will be able to walk in true freedom. And then it says, you know this, it says, they laid down their garments. They laid down coats and they laid down palms. Look at it, verse eight, many in the crowd spread their garments on the ground ahead of him and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Here's what's interesting to me here. And we don't have time to go into all of it, but even now, but especially then the garments you wore It was a communication of the identity that you had taken on or that you had, okay? So essentially, the garments equal identity, and it says that they laid that down. So what does that mean for you and I? Maybe you have picked up labels or you've picked up an identity that is not who God created you to be. And to truly see Jesus as the King of Kings, you might have to take that and lay it down. I'm not minimizing. A lot of people have identity because of trauma in their life or because of letdown in their life. And I'm not minimizing any of that. But what I am saying is Jesus is truly, his love is greater than all of that. And if we can learn to lay our identity down, if we can learn to lay the labels that maybe we've given ourselves or other 
other people have spoken over us. If we can learn to lay those things down, then we can truly see Jesus as king and truly walk with him all the days of our life. It's the same with the palm fronds. Why would palm fronds? Well, historically, palm fronds, if they waved that or laid it down, it was a communication of the ultimate victory, right? That that king that was coming back into the city was the ultimate victor of all. And we see that with Jesus. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave. He won back absolute victory for you and I as children of God. But watch this. Sometimes we try to take, what, what do palm fronds do? They, they can create shelter and shade. That if we try to hide under certain things, we never actually get to walk in the victory that Jesus paid for. And he did more for us than just letting us hide in shade and shelter and not accepting his victory for us. That is what I want us to see today. In the Palm Sunday story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem, the instruction, maybe, maybe you just need to hear that, that God wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. That he will send you. He will give you the next instruction for you to obey. Maybe you relate to the donkey. Maybe people have called you other words for donkey, right? And you're like, man, I just, I, I don't know if I really have purpose or my life matters. I just kind of go through the, the motions. You may feel like that. But you've got to realize that God has put you here for such a time as right now. Maybe that's the only reason you heard this today is to let you know, hey, you may not feel as adequate as everybody else, but Jesus still wants you to carry him to people. And maybe you need really good people around you. You need those people to help untie you so you can really walk in freedom. And maybe you're walking around with labels that you need to lay down, that you need to cast at the feet of Jesus. Maybe you've been hiding in the shade or in shelter instead of walking in Jesus' true victory that he paid for. I don't know which one you need, but I hope something today has spoke to your heart out of the Palm Sunday story as we're leading up to Resurrection Sunday morning. My name is Trevor, and here at Champion Church, our heart is to help you champion every season of your life. We have hundreds of videos to help you do that. Make sure, if you have not, to like, share, and subscribe. I told you about the new podcast that just came out. And if, you, if you're like, hey, I would love for you to do a teaching on this or do a teaching on that, just, just hit us up, DM us, leave a comment, get it to us, and I promise you, I'll record something special just for you. Until next time, God bless you. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, before you go, thank you for watching this far. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so we can help you champion every season of your life.